Having been used as a Jewish cemetery for over 3,000 years, the Mount of Olives, Har Hezetim in Hebrew, contains over 150,000 graves, including tombs traditionally associated with the priest Zachariah and the King David's son Absalom. On the upper slope, the traditional tomb of the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are situated. Come with me on a journey, the quest for answers, looking for Jesus and the Holy Land. The Mount of Olives separates the Judean desert to the east from the city of Jerusalem. The olive trees that cover the mount in the past are responsible for its name. An alternate name cited in the Talmud and the Midrash is the Mount of Anointing, named after the anointing oil prepared from the olives that grew there to anoint kings and high priests. The Mount of Olives is part of a high ridge about four kilometers in the length and belongs to the central north-south mountain range, which runs through Palestine. The peak of the Mount of Olives is 830 meters above sea level, about 100 meters above the old city of Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is first mentioned in the Bible in connection with David's flight from Absalom. Solomon chose this mountain for the construction of high places for the foreign deities of Sidon, Moab, and Ammon each of which were later destroyed by Josiah. Ezekiel records the vision of the glory of God departing from the temple and resting on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives may be most famous for the apocalyptic prophecy in the book of Zechariah, stating that God will stand on the Mount of Olives and the mountain will split in two, with one half shifting north and the other half shifting south. Later Jewish interest in the mountain is recorded in the Mishnah. The burning of the red heifer was an elaborate ceremony on the Mount of Olives. In addition, since the mountain was clearly visible from the east, it was used as a signal station to indicate the new moon. According to one legend, the dove sent from the ark by Noah plucked their leaf from the Mount of Olives. According to the Talmud, the resurrection process will begin on the Mount of Olives at the end of days. Many Jews believe that those buried on the mount will be the first to rise to everlasting life. For this reason, Jews have always sought to be buried on the slopes of the mount. The Jews of Jerusalem have customarily sent soil from the Mount of Olives in bags to Jewish communities in the diaspora, so the Jews living outside of Israel could spread this soil on the graves of their beloved. regularly visited the Mount of Olives. He frequently crossed it on his way to Bethany to visit his friend Lazarus. His famous Olivet Discourse was given on the Mount of Olives. When Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he rode over and down the Mount of Olives on a donkey. Jesus prayed with the disciples on the Mount of Olives just before his arrest that fateful night. During the arrest, Peter struck the servant of the high priest with a sword and cut off his ear. Today, however, we're on the Mount of Olives to remember Christ's ascension. There's a humble little chapel here, appropriately called the Chapel of the Ascension. This site was identified as the place of Christ's ascension by Constantine's mother, Helena, back in the fourth century. She constructed a rotunda on this site, which was open to the sky and was surrounded by three circular porticos. 
this original chapel was destroyed in the 7th century. The main structure of the current chapel dates from the Crusader era. After the fall of Jerusalem in 1187, Salah ad-Din converted the building into a mosque. However, the vast majority of pilgrims to the site were Christian. So as a gesture of compromise and goodwill, Salah ad-Din ordered the construction two years later of a second mosque nearby for Muslim worship. While Christian pilgrims continued to visit the main chapel. Inside this chapel is the Ascension Rock, said to contain the right footprint of Christ. If this is indeed the rock from which Christ ascended, then it's the last point on earth touched by the incarnate Christ. If this isn't the exact spot, don't worry. The actual site of the Ascension must be very close by. Acts 1.12 indicates that Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives. The Gospel of Luke gives us this account. Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left and was taken up to heaven. Bethany is on the Mount of Olives, on the east side of the hill, the side away from Jerusalem. And so you cannot see Jerusalem from Bethany. However, if you walk from Bethany half a mile up the hill to the summit, you are treated with an amazing view of Jerusalem. This is the best place to come to take photos of the holy city. indicates that Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives. That means that Christ was caught up into heaven from a place very near this spot. Let's read the account in Acts 1, 8 to 12. Jesus told the disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Let's unpack these verses today. I'd like to comment briefly on three items. One, Christ's commission. Two, Christ's ascension. And three, Christ's reunion. First of all, notice Christ's commission. Just before he was caught up into the clouds, Jesus gave his disciples a commission. He told them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This commission is just as important to us today. We too need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to be witnesses to Christ. Jesus told the disciples that they were to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is actually an outline for the book of Acts in which the gospel spread from Jerusalem to increasingly distant uh, mission fields, even the ends of the earth. There's a message here for all of us. We ought first to be witnesses to those who are closest to us, the people in our homes, our workplaces, and our local communities. From there, Christ sends us to reach out further and further until the entire world has heard the good news about Jesus, our risen Savior and our soon coming King. Each of the four Gospels mentions the commission Christ gave to his disciples at the conclusion of his earthly ministry. Perhaps the commission recorded in Matthew's Gospel is the best known. Jesus said to his followers, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Still today, Jesus calls us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us. Secondly, Acts 1 describes Christ's ascension. The Bible declares that while the disciples watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Jesus rose straight up from the ground right into the clouds and disappeared from their sight. The disciples stood there looking up, trying to get one last glimpse of Jesus as he disappeared into the clouds. With their heads tilted right back, they were shielding their eyes from the sun, S-U-N, to get one last look at the sun, S-O-N. Can you imagine what they were feeling as Jesus was received up into the clouds? I think they, I think they must have felt the whole gamut of emotions, wonder, excitement, sadness, grief, you name it. Thirdly, Acts 1 talks about Christ's reunion. Then two angels spoke to the disciples saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Did you catch the promise? The angels said that Jesus will return to this earth again. This same Jesus will come back in the same way he went. He went up in the clouds and he's coming back in the clouds. He went up with a real body and he's coming back with a real body. He went up visibly and he's coming back visibly. The Bible says, behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Friend, this same Jesus is coming back again. This same Jesus. Jesus with flesh and bones. Jesus with nail prints in his hands and feet. Jesus with a wound in his side. This same Jesus who walked and talked and prayed with the disciples. The same Jesus who went away in the clouds will return the same way. I can't wait. What a reunion that will be. Jesus himself had promised the disciples a wonderful reunion. At the Last Supper, he had told them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Friend, the heart of Jesus longs for the day when he will be reunited with all of his disciples. Jesus has eternity in view. The reason he came to this earth, the reason he laid down his life is so we can be with him forever. And let me tell you, forever is a long, long time. Jesus told the disciples about the mansions in the Father's house, the mansions in the New Jerusalem. What Jesus had in mind when he gave this beautiful reunion promise to the disciples is the same thing John the Revelator was shown in vision in Revelation 21. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Friend, heaven is real. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Just an eternity to be with Jesus and the rest of the redeemed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank God for Acts 1 and this powerful description of Christ's commission, Christ's ascension, and Christ's reunion.
The Bible repeatedly assures us that Jesus will return. One scholar has estimated that there are 1,845 references to Christ's second coming in the Old Testament, where 17 books give it prominence. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 318 references to the second advent of Christ. An amazing one out of every 30 verses, 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to his great event for every prophecy in the Bible concerning Christ's first advent. There are eight which look forward to his second coming. A Christian's life stretches between two realities. The first reality is that Jesus is coming soon. The second is that we are still here. It's so important to find balance between living with our daily routine and living with the expectation that Christ could come any day. But what's the key to being ready for the second coming? In my humble opinion, loving Christ's second coming is the main key that summarizes all the other aspects of preparing for Jesus' appearing. The Apostle Paul in his final words said, Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who loved his appearing. If we love the second coming, we will watch and pray. Jesus said, watch, therefore, and pray, always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man, in Luke 21, verse 36. Jesus strongly urges his followers to make earnest preparations, not to be caught off guard. If we love the second coming, we will study God's book to get better acquainted with God. We need to become thoroughly dependent on the Lord by the study of his word. If we love the second coming, we will remain faithful. We need to be loyal and committed to Christ and his teachings, not being just listeners of the word, but doers also. If we love the second coming, we will share the good news. We need to share what we have obtained from the minds of truth regarding the second advent and God's special message that will get people's attention and commitment. In this short series on the life of Jesus, we visited some very special places. Here in the land of Israel, there are so many powerful reminders of Jesus. But the reality is this, you don't have to come to Israel to get better acquainted with Christ. Certainly it's a privilege to visit this place. It really makes the Bible come to life. But the most important thing you can do to get to know Jesus better is to establish the habit of spending time alone with him each day in Bible study and prayer. I challenge you to read the Gospels through often, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. As you read, let your imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing scenes of Christ's life. Read these accounts as you would read a love letter at the height of romance. I also encourage you to get a copy of the book, The Desire of Ages by Ellen White. This book is an inspired commentary on the life of Christ. A few years back, the head librarian at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. said The Desire of Ages is the best book that has ever been written about Jesus. Keep meeting with your small group. If you're not currently in a group, I challenge you to make it a top priority in your life to find a group that's right for you. Next to your daily devotional time, participation in a small group is the best thing you can do for your relationship with Jesus. My appeal to you today is this, keep growing. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And now, Pastor Ron, tell us about the song you'll be singing for us today. This song was written on a Friday morning at BC Camp Meeting. It was the first camp meeting that I had ever attended and I was so blessed by the presentations and the fellowship of God's people. I had heard that it would be good 
to focus on the closing scenes of Christ's life in order to more fully grasp the gift of God's grace. And uh, so I read uh, some key chapters in a book called The Desire of Ages. And it was uh, a moving experience. Uh, I thought that it would have been hard for Jesus to contemplate not only his suffering, but his separation from his disciples and ultimately from us. But then looking down through time, Jesus was comforted in the thought of his return. And it is in this blessed hope of his return that you and I find hope, courage and resolve to be found faithful to him. May each one of us be comforted in the thought of Christ's return. Jesus said, I'll be back again. Just before I go, I'd like to tell you all Just how much I've loved to have you near I've shared with you the love of our God above The purpose of my life these past few years Shortly now I won't be found among you Shortly now my ministry must end and oh how I hate the thoughts of leaving you But I promise you I'll be back again It would be best if you would please come with me now I must pray but need to have you near I must go and pray at Gethsemane To speak with my father so dear Shortly now I won't be found among you Shortly now my ministry must end And oh how I hate the thoughts of leaving you But I promise you I'll be back again Do you all believe that God's promised Son has come? Do you all believe you're grounded in the truth? I must confess that although you see darkly now, the death I must endure will give you proof. Shortly now I won't be found among you. Shortly now my ministry must end And oh how I hate the thoughts of leaving you But I promise you I'll be back again The days ahead will someday help to comfort you Though the days ahead will surely break your heart but when you strength and cling to this blessed hope Someday we'll never have to part Shortly now I won't be found among you Shortly now my ministry must end And oh how I hate the thoughts of leaving you But I promise you I'll be back again Shortly now I won't be found among you But I promise you I'll be back again Thank you, Pastor Ron Nelson. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you for the greatest promise ever that Jesus will come again. 
May you bless everyone that is listening my voice right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friend, thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget to share the quest for answers looking for Jesus in the Holy Land with your friends and relatives. Please visit our website. On our website, you can leave us a message, your prayer request, and order a copy of today's show or the complete series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you again soon. Until then, remember, Jesus is coming soon. <music>